Hi, I'm Emma Sale, the um, CEO and founder of the KK Group, which in a nutshell um, is empowering women from the bedroom to the boardroom with from the bedroom, which is Killing Kittens business, um, launched in 2005 and sister launched in the last couple of years um, for professional women. So everything, everything we do is about women. So I am very honored um, to have been asked to tell my story at this amazing event. Um, to me, I'm just going to say it's a bit weird. I'm used to humans and human interaction and the energy of people being like in front of me speaking. So I'm not going to lie. It's taken a lot of takes to get this video right, because A, I don't like looking at myself on the screen talking or the sound of my own voice, which again is a bit weird and not having not having humans in front of me um, to talk. So here we are. So thank you very much for having me here. And um, the main thing I'm speaking about is, and something I really forget a lot, is the craziness of the business that I launched. And in a world, the adult world, a world that was very male and is very male, um, and launching it in my early 20s um, as well, when the world back then, I'm 43 now, um, so it's been 16 years, was not the way it is at the moment. And um, I always say I never got the memo. People say, you have the boundaries and the barriers and oh well how did you do that because it was how did you launch how did you feel launching a business in a man's world and in the sex industry and I said I didn't get the memo I was so in my head wanting to change the world and on a mission that the mission was so much bigger than me as an individual that it just kept going um and is still going now but a lot of people always say and the main is the biggest question people are is why and how I mean why would anyone want to grow up organizing orgies for a living or as a, as a business or working in the sex world? Um, you know, what were you thinking? Why did you do it? What? And it was then to go back to the original, you know, the story of where it started has to go back to sort of my childhood and growing up. And from the minute I could talk, I came out at pace and questioned everything. And I looked around me at the world and I saw that I say I call it a fire in my belly and for anyone who wanting to you know wanted to launch a business or do something I say what's your fire what's that thing inside you um that is firing you up and on on a, a lot of the time it is it is anger and it's rage and it's pissed offness with something that you feel isn't right and you want to fix and I came into a world where with a very narcissistic military dad very controlling emotionally abusive um to my mum and was very much women know your place and I came into that's the what I had in my the family life and the shouting and um and just I'm watching that but I was at an all-girls boarding school and at school I was being told and taught that I could be whatever I wanted to be and I could go out into the world and rule it and I was the same as boys and men and and all the opportunities were the same and that's what I believed from my schooling that I could do that. And then I was going home and seeing something different whilst at the same time living in the Middle East. So this double whammy of term time, you can get out there and you can rule the world and you're all equal to going home to you're not, you're a piece of crap, you're a second rate citizen and you're gonna be treated like shite. Um, and you know, you've got to settle and you've got to sort of, it's all about the man and, and pleasing the man and looking after your man. And it's all about getting married and having children. And that's sort of why you're, why you're on this earth as a female and it was a real you know, mishmash um, of psychology going on in my head um, and it this fire kept growing and growing and growing of like that's not right it doesn't have to be like that why can't we climb trees the way boys and I was all I was a tomboy and I was a sports freak and I was always in my gym kit and I I kind of set had this kind of screw you if they can do it I can do it attitude and I think the anger of what I was seeing at home made spurred me on even more in a bit of a screw you I started playing the trombone because no one else in my school played it I played the drums for a bit because no one did and it, I didn't think it was very feminine so I was like right I'm gonna do everything that boys do um just to prove a point I think difficult I was difficult um and then went into university um and out into the sort of the dating world of of how women and men interacted and dating and again watched as these guys at uni would just shag around and sleep with anything that moved and they were bragging about threesomes and everything like that and and high-fived and 
girl still you know wanted to go out with them and it because it didn't matter all these sports guys um it didn't matter if they'd slept with twenty thousand women the week before it's like you still wanted them as your boyfriend meanwhile girls were sort of the, the slut shaming and the guilt and god forbid a girl had a one night stand or i mean even the thought of a girl snogging another girl back then was like wow i mean that's out there and who does she think she is and that's was sort of the conversations going on around me and good male friends of mine saying i've met an amazing girl but um she's not girlfriend material and we're like well why is she not girl girlfriend material oh because she slept with loads of guys and you just this anger in me was just burning 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 and then came out into the big boy world of thinking i can get out there and i can rule the world and do what boys do on a professional level maybe the dating side is very you know biased um and imbalanced but in the professional world i can do any, everything that they do um but went to work in the city and very quickly had harassment issues with one of my bosses who so moved me to sit next to him away from the team. He was very touchy feely. He, when we were, went to, you know, go out for pictures, he'd tell me to put a short skirt on, um, put, get a switch. I want you in a short skirt because we need to win this pitch. Yes, I have good legs. I'll give you that. I'll back myself on that. But it is not the sort of thing you say to a 21 year old that's going to win the pitch of, I need your legs out. Um, but I can, when I went and complained um, to HR about that, was told to really think about it, that did I really want to complain? That did I really want to stay working in the city? Because if I did, I'd be seen as a troublemaker. And this was a woman, this was a woman in her forties who was the HR director, basically telling me to keep my mouth shut if I didn't want to be seen as a troublemaker. So I then left that. Um, and at the same time was in a pretty emotionally abusive um, um, relationship myself. He was like, by by Polo in one week, he'd speak to me and the next week, he wouldn't speak to me. It just sort of went on. So I was in a bad place all around. And, and started, again, started looking at what was going on around me on the dating front and friends kind of in abusive relationships and, or, you know, friends who were sleeping around. And I had this group of girlfriends who I just thought owned it and backed themselves sexually. And they just didn't care. And I thought they were amazing. And it was quite a well-known group in London at the time. And they were much older. Um, I was early 20s, they were in their 30s. And I was doing the helping do the PR for the erotica show. And that got me into the adult industry of seeing the weird and wonderful and amazing, crazy people who weren't crazy. They were just being their true selves and they didn't care what anyone thought. Um, and I just found this amazing, this amazing world. Um, and at the same time, though, I found that I was looking at all the businesses in that world, whether it was lingerie companies, sex toy companies, events, all the porn industry companies. It was all run by men, um, directed by men. Everything is designed by men. But a lot of it claiming to be for women. And I, again, the anger and fire in me was once again, there's men, the patriarchy are telling us women folk how we should behave, what we want, what we should like in the bedroom, what we should be doing sexually. And again, it was all about them from a male's perspective and a male's view. Um, and that's when I just went, fuck this. <laughs> and was in Ibiza at a wedding um, and someone phoned in who couldn't make the wedding and said, is everyone just sat around killing kittens at the moment? And we had this whole conversation about well, what is killing kittens? It, and it's actually cyber slang. It's amazing how few people ask me why the business is called Killing Kittens when it's a ridiculous name, really. Um, and why, and basically it's cyber slang for every time you masturbate, God kills a kitten. So that's where it's come from. So it's just loads of people wanking, it's killing loads of kittens. Um, sorry to be crass and offending anyone um, listening, but that's, that's where it came from. And it, in my head instantly, I like to the KK. The business has always been KK. It's a K is a very powerful letter. And when you look at letters and it's always, it's a very feminine letter as well. And to me, it was always KK and I wanted to stand for something. And I wanted to build this world online and offline where women were massively in control. It was all about you. I flipped society on its head of what was normal. Um, they were in control. They had to make the first moves. It was a safe space, non-judgmental space for women to explore their sexuality, chat to like-minded individuals, be part of a community without that judgment, without that shame, without that guilt. Um, 
and that's where it started it started with events 16 years ago um and a small online chat functionality and it's now grown into what is now a, a tech business uh, on paper and over 200,000 members and it's all the main part of it is the education online side of it and the social network and the dating side but very much with women at the core of it um and the way sister spun out of that was to me and it's another one of the things i've i've learned is you need it you need a hobby you need passions you need hobbies that aren't your business you need and too many people get stuck into doing this one thing and mine's always been sport and i had this group called the sisterhood i started at the same time as killing kittens as a whole group of girls raising loads of money for different women and children's charities and they've been my rock and they've been there for 16 years with more and more girls joining and no matter what i've been going through on a personal level i've had my sisterhood um and they and on that front the sisterhood we did loads of different massive sports events but they are my they're my tribe and they they are my people and that's a big thing that i always say to people and again people forget it and they they especially women we get caught up in our in partners and boyfriends or the job that we lose track and we lose touch with everything out of that there's no perspective perspective basically of of the bigger picture and the important things out there and the and to me your tribe is is more important than anything really anything is more important than the, the work you do um launching businesses the, those right people around you um will build you up will make you want to go out and rule the world so to me and one and one massive thing i say to people because it's very easy when you're getting when you're launching a business or even you know when you've had a baby or you've moved you've moved cities and you're starting a new job it's very easy to get completely sucked in to just focusing on that and you forget about the people around you and you forget or having the right people around you and you become a bit of an island and there is nothing worse I think we've all seen it in the last 18 months nothing worse than isolation and what it does to you mentally and socially and we are so you know we are animals we're social animals and we need that social interaction and that physical interaction to survive it's why we're the top of the food chain it's what we've always done we've interacted and we've evolved um socially and so on that that, that tribe side of thing is you've also got to remember that that you can't have one person for everything and that's another thing i've seen i think especially women we put so much onto you've had friends all your life the same friends this little group and they are that's it there's no one else around there there's just this little group or you put everything onto your your partner and you expect him to tick or her every single box um that from you know talking politics to talking jobs to talking your innermost fantasies to just having a good rant it's sort of you would put everything onto one person and you need different tribes and different people for the different things in your life and what I have learned is that without are the only way I have done what I've done and I have three children under six and now we've got these two businesses KK and, and sister and that people always say how how do you do it how do how do you do it I mean apart from wine and CBD oil they're like a given but how do you do it um and it's i don't do it i do it because i have amazing groups around me who help me do it i have amazing childcare structure of befriending the nursery teachers i made that effort to get to know the nursery teachers so they babysit and when one of my little ladies was very ill in hospital at four months old the nursery manager actually stayed in slept in the hospital for 48 hours because we were juggling i was juggling having to do events over in venice to have the other two other two kids a husband who was off on a hockey tour um and we just couldn't and without that without actually putting my faith in other in a, trusting other people that's the big thing is actually trusting other people so that on the family life and on the childcare side you trust them on the team side is actually letting other people work and delegating that's the big one and you don't we don't delegate enough and we want to do it all and from the more and more i've delegated and let other people do it and trust and i say my business is my baby as well as my other babies it's sort of trusting them to get on with it and then socially having 
the you know the sisterhood tribe um and sisters i've met through our sister business of different you know sounding boards from from other directors and founders and entrepreneurs who have launched their own business who are all in their 40s and 50s that who that can relate to a lot of the you know issues i have um because you have you're all different and then i have school friends and i have uni friends but the problem is you those they're not a lot of them won't relate to where i am and the position i'm in and if you put too much expectation on a, a small group ticking every single box you're just going to get disappointed and you're also going to feel you can't be open and you can't be honest and you can't be really vulnerable about what's really going on in your life because they're not on the same way page as you it's very difficult to get people on the same page as you so when you're looking for your tribe it's you you've got to take away that well I've known these people all my life you know they're my homies they're they know me better than anyone because they might know you better than anyone but that doesn't necessarily mean they are the most supportive of you more than anyone because this brings you this brings me on to the naysayers and you know I launched the business in the adult world and I was 24 25 and a lot of my friends and family were like what the hell are you doing you know this that judgment it was in the sex world I was launching events where actually people had sex and they explored sexually and I mean what on earth was I thinking and it was embarrassing and and you know they say for normal businesses probably nine out of ten people around you will say what are you doing and put doubt in your mind and make you think about you know, are you really sure you want to be doing this? But I think I probably had 99.9% .9 of everyone around me going, you're mad um, and crazy lady. Um, but, you know, there's that there's saying of like, don't let the noise of other people's opinions drown out your inner voice. And that's your inner voice as women. We lose it growing up as girls because we're too worried about the people around us and not upsetting people and being judged and and you know not having negativity and trying to please everyone that often we lose we lose sight of what that voice is and that voice is telling us um to do and with the tribe around you you've got to know well, what who are the people that make you happy who who when you walk by who are the ones not clapping you know when something goes right it's very easy to see the people in front of you going yeah you're awesome well done and clapping but do you do you notice the people they are friends around you who the look in their eyes that resentment a bit of jealousy you and you can't control that and often those people the toxic friends and family are the worst a lot of the time because they people don't like change people like to be in a comfort zone they like the norm of what they're used to and if you are growing and you're changing and you're wanting to do something different and you're wanting to launch your own business or move to another city then you are rocking their world and upsetting the dynamic and forcing change on them that they don't want a lot of the time so they will project onto you and by projecting they'll be the ones saying Mm, have you thought about this do you really think that's going to work I don't think you've thought that through you should just probably stay in the job you're doing have you spoken about it you know with your husband or it's that it's very you know hard to notice that projection and it's very easy to take that on and go oh my god they're right I shouldn't be doing this and they plan so just be aware of where the comments are coming from because often those ones you think are closest to you are the ones who will be the most negative to you so now i want to talk to you um about curiosity and failing and being vulnerable and the, you know these these words that you know are sort of frowned upon and you know you've got to be strong and you've got to have it all together and you've got to be a superwoman and you've got to know exactly what you're doing and you know people say these buzzwords that drive me up the wall what's your passion what's your purpose you know what do, what do you feel your passion is in life and what do you feel your purpose is in life and that can send people freaking out left, right and center, because if you don't feel like you know what your passion is, then that can spiral you down into, into, well, I don't know what my passion is. So I'm a complete failure and there's something wrong with me and I've got no creativity. So what, what am I going to do? Um, and to me, the key word is being curious and it is being, it's being curious. It's never settling. It's failing, 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 failing. And that might sound weird. Um, and, but when you look back at, it's constantly trying new things and trying things and failing is not necessarily sometimes going I don't want to do it 
that's not it's not failing being bad at everything or a business going it's it's trying something going i don't like that that's failing because you go well that's failed but it's not you don't necessarily have to see it as a failure but when i'm talking about failure failures it's that it's as long as you are trying new things you are curious you are asking questions the whole time you know growing up i as i said i've you know tried the trombone i got quite good at it to be honest but drums i was crap at the drums i was crap at singing but i wanted to try everything and i tried and i tried and sports i'm i was always trying new sports and new things i'm still trying new things trying like new cookery stuff new new i don't know just again weird and wonderful sports stuff i've started playing you know trying chess which i'm crap at but if i suddenly go actually i'm bored of that i don't want to do it anymore it's sort of that's failing because i'm not carrying it on and i'm not becoming an absolute genius or master mind at it but you've constantly got to try and you've got to be curious so my you know the big word is being curious and asking and and just questioning everything and people there is that in us especially women of not wanting to ask questions and thinking you know at sister we say there's no such thing as a silly question or we have you know we have coffee mornings that are about well what's your silly tell us your silly because it's so hard often as women to admit things because we go well that just sounds really stupid it sounds silly in our heads and we don't want to say it and it makes us seem weak or if you know if you're in a meeting at work you don't want to you know we don't want to go well actually can you explain that because i don't quite get it because you think oh my we're going to be judged they're going to think i'm stupid they're going to not promote us um we're going to get fired and it, you've just got to if you don't get something and you don't understand something just question and ask and ask and don't be afraid to ask and that's the other thing that comes to me hand in hand with being curious is that being a, being vulnerable feeling the fear be afraid being awkward and you don't grow unless you're in awkward the whole time i love being awkward it's from when you know when i launched a business and people say well how did you grow it because back then it was sort of social media hadn't really launched it was when 2004 2005 and so i was out and i was hustling and i was out and i would put myself in really awkward positions the whole time i would go to drinks events networking events where i'd blag my way in knowing that they were all 56 year old company directors at this networking event and mainly men but you just put yourself in it and i would listen and that's the other thing is 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 you put yourself in these in these situations and there's loads of, of networking setups out there and there's loads of sort of events that go on and honestly doing something even if you do something once a week where you feel awkward even if it's like you start by going and sitting in a cafe on your own or in a restaurant go and have a meal in a restaurant on your own with a glass of wine a dinner meal because people don't often go on their own for dinners do that and feel the awkwardness and that's like fear and thinking everyone's looking at you going who is this freak do they not have any friends and go through the, the conversations you have in your head and the, and the voices in your head because once you've done it once once you felt that fear once it's actually become very liberating and you know you can do it and you know you can put yourself in these weird positions and awkward conversations and and i say that's why you know i'm such a big believer in sport um and how that affects you because you're with sport you're constantly putting yourself in not knowing how the game is going to be played, not knowing what the opponent's going to do. You try new sport. Um, you run, you know, you sign up for a 5K run. If you, if, you know, that how why the whole couch, the 5K thing is brilliant. You know, you, that the fear you get and the adrenaline you get. And once you've done it, and once you've achieved it, actually it, it goes into the workplace as well because you've done it once and you've dealt with that fear and the awkwardness. Um, and everyone... The other thing, you know, especially women, we have, there's so much guilt, especially mums out there as well. And in that, are we seeing our kids enough? Are we working too much? Should we be at home more? Should we work more? It's, I, I always say I live in a permanent state of guilt. Whatever I do is not right. But what I've learned to do is I've basically given, I've got lots of little people in my head and there's fear and there's guilt and there's insecurity. Um, I've read all the good ones and these little people sit in my head and they have tea parties 
And sometimes if one gets a bit gobby, like the fear or the insecurity gets a bit gobby, then I kind of visualize the other, or, you know, one of the others just bitch slapping that, going, sit the fuck down, have a cup of tea. Let's get, you know, let's have words with yourself. And you just, I've put them in my head and I've, what where you can't, where you go wrong is by pretending they're not there, pretending they're not there, trying to get rid of them, trying to ignore them. You've got to acknowledge all these things, the guilt, the fear, the resentment, the awkwardness. It, they're all there and they're never going to go anywhere. They're always going to be there. It's how you manage them. And if you're aware of them and you deal with them, like I do with my little people, um, then you can deal with them. If you try and push them down and ignore them, then it just gets worse and worse and worse. So to me on the curious side is that you've got to get out there, be curious, ask the questions, ask the silly questions, feel awkward um, and uncomfortable and have that sort of outsider's mentality a lot of the time of taking a step back and just looking at that, looking at the big picture, looking at the different, they call it a game of chess. So look at the checkmate. Don't get caught up in all the little moves happening right in front of you. Just sort of chill out, have the tea party in your head, sit all the things down and get them to speak to each other and about why why the fear might be up, why the guilt might be up. Because very quickly when you talk like that, you then realize how ridiculous it is and actually you shouldn't be feeling guilty. And so, yeah, get those voices talking in your head. So my final, my final thing to you is to be unapologetically selfish, which that I have learned that the more and more as I've got older and older is that the boundaries and to say no, try by saying no, try saying no to people. And, you know, you'll get pushback from some people, but you won't be happy. There's that whole thing of, you know, being on an airplane and when the oxygen masks come and come down, they say you put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on your children. You need to look after you before you look after anyone else. And that's that's being selfish. It's not being a bad person. You work out what makes you tick what makes you happy, you do your things, you do your identity, and you own that and you back yourself and you dare to be different. You can't please everyone. Get off the fence, pick a side, just make a decision. You can turn around and go, oh, I made the wrong one, but you've just got to do it because you have one life. And you can either sit on that fence really comfortably trying to please everyone, or you can get off it. You can jump over the fence the whole time from one side to the next, but just pick a side and the the final thing I'd like you to do and I love this is remembering who you were when you were little that little girl before the whole world and society and the people around you told you who you should be and what you should be doing see if you can remember that make a list write it down um find your soul again anyway thank you ladies and I'm sure there's some gentlemen out there for having me um on here and if anyone is feeling a bit lost or wants to join some amazing communities either from the bedroom or the boardroom then kk and sister is open to any women of any age of any culture so come on in because there'll be someone that can help you on any topic you want but thank you very much